Go Master Coach. So uh, basically today we're going to talk about the resistance uh, to change. So when we are uh, coaching people, we, uh, we know that uh, there's a strong, uh, it can happen that they resist uh, change for different reasons and you can be stuck. And so what to do in what situation? Uh, today is going to be uh, quite an advanced class uh, because we took the model of the change management called the ADKAR, A-D-K-A-R. And for each stage, uh, what are the tools and techniques we could think of uh, for each of those stages? Uh, we won't go deep into uh, all the techniques, uh, but uh, so it's a bit like a recipe book, I would say. Huh? Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's get started. So why, why do we resist change? Uh, so why do we resist change in general? What do you think? What are the reasons why we re resist change? What have, what have been we your experience? We want to go out of our comfort zone. Right. Yeah, so we don't want to go out of your, our comfort zone. We're quite happy yeah, with the status quo. Afraid of the change. What afraid of the change. On ourselves. Perfect. Yes, anything else? Yeah, I think we can be afraid of like not controlling the situation as well. Yeah, exactly. Not being in control. Uh, scared of the unknown. Yes. Anything else? Maybe, maybe feeling a bit lost and, uh, you know, you're not sure where you're going and then mm -hmm. you kind of block. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not sure where you're going. You're not sure also how to go there. Yes. Perfect. Anything else? I remember one session you uh, mentioned that at the frontal cortex, you have this kind of like every, every experience builds a little bit of behavior. So I'm thinking right. that, you know, maybe because you are not used to this experience, there's a yeah. bit of like, I don't know if it's the right, the right name, but maybe yeah. the dissonance, cognitive dissonance. Yeah, cognitive dissonance, yes. And not, uh, you're not used to the experience and uh, you have like a neural pathways where you pass of this resistance where you're used to certain, to things a certain way. Yes, so yes, definitely. Or that could, uh, or you could have like belief, uh, and that there could be a dissonance between the, this uh, new experience compared to your beliefs. Uh, yes, is that what you're meaning, uh, Lucy? Uh, yes, correct. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Anything else, guys? Uh, maybe the client doesn't think that they need to change. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's where we're going to go through this ad car model, and at which level is your client? Maybe they don't even know; they're not even aware that they need to change. So that the A of the ad car. Uh, and so basically uh, that's the toughest stage. Huh? When you move to a later stage, uh, then it's easier and easier. And when people are aware that they need to change, it, become, it becomes easier and easier. Yeah, definitely. So not being aware that they need to change. Perfect. Anything else? Okay. And how to help uh, your client change? So from your experiences, what has worked, not worked? Um, visualize the good point after uh -huh. a change. Yeah. Yeah, so this visualization, perfect. So visualization so of the, the good point. Yeah, go, Cédric. All right. mm -hmm. Explain the reasons of the change to make uh -huh. sure they know why. Also explain the change so that they can understand better the, the impact on them. Uh -huh. And uh, for me, the, the, the strategy is to communicate a lot about really the why, the what, and the how. What and how? Can you give an example, for example, so that it becomes more sticky for us? Uh, when, when you say why we change, uh, there is always good reason, business reason. Mm -hmm. So that's the first is idea is if you want to be successful or get more money or whatever, mm -hmm. good reason you may have. The what is, is what we expect as a change. Mm -hmm. And the how is how we are going to change the mm -hmm. pace, the plan. Mm -hmm. And so the people, you can figure out what is important for them what could be the impact on them so that they can start accepting more and more the, the change, like the, the change curve, mm -hmm. and then you can move forward with them. Perfect. Okay, we're going to go through the change curve. Uh, and I love that the why, the what, and the how. Uh, the why, I think it's more like on the identity early stages of the change management, like the A of the ADCAR, and the how is the methodology uh, being aware how to change, like uh, what is the methodology I should follow the steps. Huh? Perfect. 
Okay, anything else uh, anyone wants to share about uh, how you've helped client change, what has worked or not? Um, I, I, yeah, I think for, for me, um, I, I believe you also, uh, I'm not sure if it was already mentioned in terms of like why, but maybe also the benefits of like, you know, having this change happening uh, mm -hmm. for your client. Actually, I, I'm thinking more about an example of like when I was manager, Mm -hmm. And a cultural, actually, the cultural also part, I think, is a, sometimes a reason of like the difficulty of change. I think some culture are more ready to change than others. And I think like showing what is the benefit of like uh, making this change, what does it bring to this person or around this person is really help, helpful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes. So benefits of change, focusing on the benefits. Uh, Another technique that was uh, suggested before is the visualization. Huh? So we can be quite deep in terms of blockers, like uh, uh, anchoring those benefits and visualizing what would be uh, uh, the future if, if they change. Huh? Uh, and so there are different ways uh, to visualize. Uh, first is like uh, closing the eyes and like uh, having like a visualization technique, helping them like uh, you close your eyes. How do you feel about it? Uh, uh, who are the people around you? What is this uh, new life uh, that is bringing you? So that's a visualization. The second one is uh, um, journaling because some people are not as good at uh, for visualizing. So a journaling technique. And so they can journal what would be uh, this change will bring to them. And the third one is a dream board, huh? like having a visualization board. Some people who are more visual, they may, they may like also that, uh, that technique. Huh? Okay, perfect. Okay, anything else? Um, I've used the um, visualization for limiting beliefs as well. Yeah. So not quite visualizing the change, but visualizing if things don't change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Other, negative you know, visualization. So basically if things don't change. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a huge one also. Huh? Like, uh, can you share, share how it worked, uh, Gilles, on your experience? Uh, well, well, how impactful was it like to go uh, it was um, without going too much into the details everything because it's quite complex but um, mm -hmm. I think the my coach he was um, responded well at the visualization of if he stays stuck in this situation mm -hmm. then you know one year two years three years yeah. then you realize that he does need to do something about it. He, not, he does need to change something about his situation. And then, um, then I asked him what kind of change can he bring? And then um, we kind of went on on this one. Yeah. So yeah, very good. And thank you, Jill, for sharing. And so it also gives like a sense of urgency, I feel. And when I do the limiting belief uh, webinar, that's usually the feedback I get is that, uh, uh, you know you have to change it's like oh I'll do it later like postponing or finding a plenty of excuses but when you visualize like uh, negatively what could happen if you stay there like uh, if I give my example like uh, my limiting belief was like uh, uh, when I was in Singapore I, 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 there are no good guys out there like uh, I'd rather focus on my work and uh, no need for me to look for guys there are no good guys for me out there and so you get stuck in that and I, I wouldn't be doing anything and then visualizing the negative, okay, what would happen for me like in one year, in three years, in 10 years? And so you imagine in 10 years, your life without any kids, without any families. And so that strikes you and then gives you a sense of urgency. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, okay, uh, anything else? Okay, so, uh, so uh, resistance to change, why do we resist change? So we, we, you can coach a client uh, examples like uh, stuck in a job uh, that makes you unhappy, uh, stuck in a relationship also that makes you unhappy or unhealthy habit like smoking, overeating, binge, binge watching could be any uh, uh, resistance on any different uh, topic. Huh? And we have uh, all experienced it uh, personally, I'm sure, and uh, with the people around you. Uh, being stuck in something that you don't want, but you are still stuck in that uh, situation. So with, uh, with some of you, we've discussed that, the power of habits, the neural pathways. So neural pathways, it was really deep in your, in your brain, those habits that you have learned 
uh, and that uh, are stuck with you. Um, and it's easier to stay with that uh, addictive habit, addictive behavior, uh, than to go on a new, uh, new habit. So uh, I love this uh, metaphor of a wheat field. If you always walk uh, the same path on this wheat field, then it will create a path. And this pathway is called a neural pathway. If you stop walking that path, wheat will start growing and you will walk another path, you will create a new habit, a new neural pathway. Some habits are positive, are constructive, like, I don't know, brushing your teeth in the morning. Some habits are destructive and are not uh, uh, helping you towards your goal or helping you uh, being a be better, happier, better human being, I would say. And so those are the neural pathway and they can be very, very strong. Uh, I'm used to going to work uh, every morning, uh, those habits, uh, it's going to be very difficult for me to get out of this habit. So uh, I'm in this uh, relationship at home, we've been together for tens of years, uh, it's very difficult for me to change that. Huh? Yeah. Any, any question, any comments on that? Okay. The power of inertia, so that's another uh, reason. Now I'm going through the different reasons, uh, the activation energy. Huh? So we are lazy human beings. Uh, the first what is the first decision uh, that you made in the morning? Was it to click on your, to push on your inner snooze uh, alarm? You know, we tend to be a, a lazy human beings. So this activation energy is, uh, can be uh, uh, quite difficult to get. Uh, it's easier to bitch about your current job than to find a new one. It's easier to eat that beautiful croissant, beautiful cake, instead of going on a diet. So the big secret is that you're never going to feel like it. So you have to parent yourself, push yourself to get it done and start this activation energy. Uh, it's the toughest part is to get things done, to get things moving, starting a new diet and getting this uh, uh, into this virtual circle and uh, believing in what you, in this new uh, new habit, in this new thing you're doing. Huh? So force yourself to be uncomfortable. And I love this uh, idea that uh, if you don't act from an, on an idea, on an impulse in the five first seconds, then it is killed. So basically acting means like engaging, could be even writing it down. Uh, and so you have to act on an idea in the first uh, second, otherwise it's, it won't happen, it will be killed. Huh? So getting what you want is simple, but it's not easy. Huh? So that's the power of inertia, the activation energy. Huh? That's another reason. Head in the sand, huh? like uh, excuses, we've all been there. Like uh, I'm coaching someone who wants to switch job. Uh, I don't have time. I just bought a new apartment. I don't have time to do my resume. So I'm too busy. Uh, taking care of the new apartment I bought, so excuses. Fear, we've mentioned that, huh? uh, that's a big uh, one. What's stopping you from starting a business, from, uh, from doing like this new uh, adventure sport or from going into a new relationship? Often like uh, uh, there's fear, so that's one of the biggest uh, blockers. We've mentioned that. Uh, the control now, huh? so we've mentioned that also. Huh? Uh, we need that sense of uh, safety. And always like uh, inspiring vision. Huh? So to overcome inertia, you need a sense of safety and an inspiring vision. And that's why the grow model, the G, and the visualization technique can be uh, very strong. So we'll go we'll go through that. Uh, so that's a, a summary of uh, why do we resist change. So it takes energy, the path of least resistance, the fear of the unknown. I want to feel safe and in control. I'm too busy. Uh, it's not possible. So the poor process, I won't go through it now. We're going to go through it later. I don't have the power. The sunk cost, uh, I don't know if you remember the sunk cost fallacy. That's one of the cognitive biases. Uh, so some, so uh, even in investment, in finance, or in your personal life, or in, at work, we always look too much of what we have invested in instead of making a decision now based on the, uh, the future, uh, the so basically just looking at the future and what are the different uh, paths and uh, today, uh, what is the best decision? Not looking at the sunk costs. Huh? Um, 
So that's the sunk cost fallacy. Huh? You can do the cognitive uh, bias uh, tool on the on the toolbox uh, to go through that also. I'm not really motivated. The motivation aspect uh, is my goal towards something or away from something. Huh? Uh, so that's what we've and the limiting belief. That's uh, that's a huge huge one. Huh? So uh, usually. Uh, one of the main blockers uh, when we cannot achieve a goal is a limiting belief. So we're going to go also through that. Okay. Any question on that? Those are reasons uh, you, you've mentioned uh, most of them already. We all know them uh, so far. It's, uh, I think no, no big surprises. Huh? Any questions? Okay. So now we're going to look at strategies. Okay, so again, it's going to be like a recipe book. Uh, I won't go in uh, uh, full detail on all the techniques. Uh, if you've uh, uh, done most of the webinars, you, you will know most of the techniques, but it's good to recap also. Huh? So ADCAR. ADCAR is a famous uh, change management model. So we have taken that model and look at what are the techniques for each of the stages. Uh, Gilles, you were saying like, uh, some people may not even be aware that they need to change. So that's the first one, awareness of the need to change. Uh, all the people around me know I need to change. Uh, it's quite obvious and they don't realize, they don't know why I'm not changing, but I'm not even aware that I need to change. So that's the first step of the ADCAR model and what to do in that situation. So we'll go through that. Second step is a desire to change. So now I'm aware that I need to change. Uh, I'm aware that I need to change job, but I don't really have the desire, the motivation. Uh, I have plenty of excuses. Uh, so what to do when you have a client uh, stuck in the, in the desire stage? Huh? <clears throat> Knowledge, I don't know how to change. I know, I, I know I need to change. I know I want to change. The A and the D are validated, but I don't know how to change. Okay, so I feel like the, uh, the more we go into the stages, the, the easiest it is uh, to, to coach someone. Uh, we go really from, uh, again, from transformational at the early stages about the identity, the blockers, the limiting belief, to more like a transactional, okay, what to do, like uh, almost like a to-do list. Huh? Ability, uh, do I feel I have the ability to change? Now I know I want to change, but I'm not sure I'm able to change. I don't have the skills. Uh, uh, I, I know I want to change job, but I'm not sure how to, like, I, no, I'm not sure I'm able to. Huh? And the reinforcement, how do you sustain the change? Huh? So now I, I, I know I want to change, I'm able to change, but uh, I've lost weight. So let's say I've lost uh, 10 kilos, I'm, I'm happy where I am, but how do you reinforce uh, that uh, change? How do you make sure now it's uh, my new habit uh, to be in that new healthy uh, body of mine. Any question on that model? Okay, so that's the ad car model. Again, that's a very famous model. Huh? I'm not uh, reinventing the wheel here for change management. Huh? And so we're gonna go for each stage, what are the techniques that we should use? Uh, first stage, awareness. So I'm not even aware that I need to change. What are the techniques at this stage that you think would make sense? Uh, because I'm going to suggest some techniques, but again, I, I, I'm not the one that know everything here. So happy also to get uh, your insights and always good to share. So what are the techniques that you would use? You have a client that is stuck here. They don't even know uh, that they need to change. It's quite obvious to everyone around them, to you that they need to change, that they're suffering from that change, but they're not even aware. So what would you do yeah. here? I uh, would use a 360. Ah, 360, I love that, yes. Perfect, yeah. I love it. I'm gonna write it down because I haven't suggested that one, but I love it for the next class. Yes, 360 is a great one so that other people can open their eyes, yeah. Yeah, Perfect. when I reach out of idea, I mean, I go with 360 and that's very powerful. Yeah. Because there is always one person, I mean, giving the obvious answers that nobody wants to talk about and um, when the people are open to do the 360 for them, they are open to read all the comments and that helps a lot to make them change. Perfect, I love it. 
Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. And usually I recommend after the 360, before you debrief you, with your client, uh, put the, uh, ask your client to put the, uh, all the comments and main ideas on a Johari window. Huh? So I'll let you look into it. Uh, what is a Johari window? Uh, but it's easier because there, if you ask, if they have like 10 feedbacks and 10 questions at 100 answers. So it's easier if you go through the stage where they debrief uh, themselves, like with themselves, like looking at uh, you know, what are the big ideas, and then you can also debrief the gaps with them on the Johari window. Perfect. Thank you, Cedric. Any other ideas of the what could work here? Um, the Wheel of Life. Uh huh. Yeah. Where they can see where, obviously, where they are in various areas of their life, and then they need to, they want to move to a different level, and so what needs to change and bring this awareness maybe to them. Uh -huh. Perfect, yeah. So do you have an example here of uh, an experience that you had or no? Uh, so Not I, necessarily, no. So I have one, for example, I was coaching someone, uh, she wanted to uh, find a new job. Uh, her main objective was about her career and the next, uh, her next role. And then when I did the real Wheel of Life, I realized that the biggest gap was on the relationship uh, and that she wanted to move out of Singapore uh, for relationship reason, like because she wanted to uh, to find someone and have a, have a new life uh, in France, uh, actually. Yeah. So uh, that helped her, like uh, being aware that her main objective was uh, was not as much the career as she she thought it was, but more like on the relationship aspect. Huh? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Any other ideas like what could work here? So we talked about 360, Wheel of Life. There's another one that we've done uh, that is a big, uh, big one that we could use when people are stuck. Yeah. The limiting belief. Yeah, the limiting belief. Huh? The limiting belief is a, is a big, uh, a big one. Huh? Uh, so people having limiting belief, not being even aware that they have those limiting beliefs, and how much those limiting beliefs are blocking them uh, to reach their goals. Huh? Yes. Perfect. And this one is not easy to use uh, the tool. No? Um, when I made okay. uh, my clients do that, I didn't find they were very convinced about their limiting beliefs. Ah, can you share a bit more yeah. about it? I asked them to um, have one or two, um, two of them to, to do that. And uh, I was expecting them to start looking themselves in different way and to try to identify their limiting beliefs. And I didn't find the result I expected. Um, for me, they, they, they did the exercise and they were okay. And they were saying, okay, I have some limiting beliefs, but they didn't do the, the, the step forward, making okay. the assumption that everything that were around them were limiting beliefs at some point. Some were more limiting than others. And then I didn't see they were, I mean, uh, really questioning their, their feelings. And so have you done yeah. the full methodology where they were visualizing the negative, the positive, everything? Or? But that's, that's what I did. I mean, I asked to okay. really go further on the visualization and really uh, ask them to explain more some of their beliefs. Yeah. And then I was using counter examples to show them that where they were going wasn't the right way. Uh -huh. But it was uh, longer than uh, just using the tool. Yeah. yeah, it takes time. Huh? Sometimes it's, uh, it takes time for people. It's very, uh, again, like very identity, transformational, the, the limiting belief. Huh? So it may take time for them to, uh, to mm. realize. Huh? So for me, my own limiting belief, it took me like maybe 10 webinars of limiting belief to overcome it. Huh? So being the teacher. Yeah. So yes, and knowing that it was a limiting belief and I was not acting on it. So that you, 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 you think that they're not acting on it or that they're not even they're not, not realizing that it's a limiting belief? As you said, it took me uh, two or three sessions to, to get them really uh, comfortable with this being a limiting belief versus okay. the 360 or where I saw the, the impact that was much mm. more immediate. Yeah. It was coming from their people because what is good in the 360 when you use mm -hmm. the 360 with friends, yeah. family and, and co-workers, mm -hmm. they really choose people that I think are close to them or, mm -hmm. uh, or which they value the, the opinion. Mm -hmm. And when they get feedbacks, 
they take those feedbacks very seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, from my experience, I, I feel it's quite normal. Some people, they like when I do the webinar, limiting belief webinar, some people, they would even cry and have a strong realization like uh, in like 30 minutes. And some people, it would take like, uh, for me, it took me 10 sessions. So see, uh, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it can be tough to, to understand the, the, how much uh, it is ingrained in ourselves, those beliefs. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you feel it's uh, it's because of the methodology, it's, it's something, or is it like uh, how? I don't know yet. I mean, it's, I don't I don't have enough experience. At, I think to, to really be clear, but mm -hmm. I was questioning because I was expecting the result of the limiting belief uh, quite immediate and wasn't the case. Mm. When the 360, I said, okay, this one, I will use it really. And last, mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, last step and I was really impressed by the yeah the the, the and the, what they got back from this mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Yeah I think I think it's quite normal. Uh, it's quite important to find the right limiting belief to work on when you do the exercise to validate with them that's uh, that's uh, that they uh, that it's a really a strong blocker for them. Uh, otherwise we do we do this stage so you work on the right uh, limiting beliefs that they, uh, that they want to work on, basically. I don't know if that could be the case, but yeah. yeah. And what I'm trying, I mean, with the, the next one, uh -huh. I did the 360 earlier, uh -huh. and then I will do the limiting ah, belief yeah. afterwards to yeah, see if idea. there's a strong impact on when you do that. Ah, yeah, good idea. Yeah, yeah. I love to do the 360 also uh, quite early on in the process. Huh? Yeah, I usually do it at a second session. So they are between the first and second session to get the feedback. So yeah, I agree, I agree. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So let us know how it goes. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, some tools, they may work faster than others on some people or other people or, uh, and the limiting beliefs, yes, it can take a lot of time for some people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Any, any other ideas of tools we could use at that stage? Yeah, okay. Uh, so basically, uh, investigate a disease. So a disease in, uh, in two words, that they are not at ease. When you can feel that someone is not at ease, you know, uh, I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, I have low energy these days. I don't know why. Uh, there's, there's something wrong with me. The mind and body is not aligned. So really this uh, disease uh, and understand w where it's coming from. Uh, the, the conscious mind is the goal setter. That's the one that's going to help you set a goal that's going to be very conscious. But the unconscious mind is really the go getter. That's the one that is uh, the, the bottom of the iceberg. That is the toughest one to tap on. But that's the most important one because it's really the one that can help you get to your goal. Uh, limiting belief are an example uh, of, uh, of that. Huh? So, that's uh, the first stage, like understanding if there's something wrong, like they, you can sense that uh, there's a misalignment. Uh, someone is like feeling uh, low energy or something is wrong with me. Uh, understanding the fears, so facing the fears, understanding like uh, uh, if your client is consciously uh, uh, saying like, I'm scared of the unknown, like uh, uh, facing those fears and how to do that, you can uh, investigate. Uh, those can be limiting belief or not, huh, but uh, uh, we talked about that, uh, investigate uh, limiting belief and do that uh, intervention that uh, Cedric was uh, mentioning uh, through limiting belief. When you're struggling to achieve a goal, usually there's a limiting belief. Huh? So that's one of the main ones at, uh, at the A stage of the ADCAR model, huh? the limiting belief. Um, I won't go through it in details. Uh, you have the recorded session of the limiting belief or there's uh, always limiting belief uh, uh, webinars coming, uh, elective coming. <clears throat> so first stage is acknowledging, understanding uh, uh, what limiting belief to work on. So if you remember in the webinar, we look at what is your dream life? Uh, what is this uh, ideal life if there's no uh, issue of uh, uh, no issue of time and money, what would be this dream life? And the second question is, what, uh, what is preventing you from living that dream life? And the third one, like uh, 
uh, in your childhood, what are the stories that you were told that, that you're telling yourself and are still stuck with you? And then your client will look at one limiting belief that they want to work on, acknowledging, uh, or that could be also when you're coaching them, when they use like a, a generalization or I can't, I am, I have to. Uh, and so you can listen for those limiting beliefs. Uh, second stage, once you have noticed a limiting belief that the client wants to work on, visualization technique, what is the uh, impact of keeping this uh, limiting belief? So Jill, I think it was Jill uh, talking about that, uh, uh, the negative impact, uh, uh, like what would be your life in, uh, in one year, three years, 10 years, you look at yourself in the mirror, what would you tell yourself? So this negative visualization. Uh, now I have this limiting belief. I want to reframe into empowering belief. Uh, all the good guys are taken. I will never be able to find a good guy. Okay, I just need to find one good guy. I will be able to find one. Okay, that's my new mantra. And I keep telling myself. And uh, limiting belief and uh, empowering belief are self-fulfilling. Huh? You keep telling yourself a story and it's self-fulfilling. So to break that uh, vicious circle, you have to create a new virtual circle with this new empowering belief. So meaning, okay, I can't find any good guy. Okay, I'm now my new belief, I will be able to find a new, a new guy. So what is the smallest step you can take? So that's a question I love to ask my clients. Now that you have this new empowering belief, what is the smallest step you can take? Uh, and so for me, okay, I, I'm gonna go in a bar and try to meet guys. Okay, that's, a, that's the first step. And then I'm gonna get results and then there's a virtual circle. Huh? So we form our belief as a result of our experiences. So empowering belief, I won't go through that. Huh? Uh, you've seen it in the, in the webinar. Uh, okay. So the one who thinks he can and the one who thinks he can't are both usually right. One of my favorite quotes from Confucius. So if you think you can, you're already, you're already right. If you think you can't, you're also right. Huh? So that's a, a limiting belief and empowering belief. And the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who should do. So that's a Steve Jobs. So you have to be crazy enough huh, to think you can change so that uh, you will. Huh? So uh, you have to believe in yourself first before making any change. Uh, another one is uh, we've talked about that for those who've seen the NLP uh, uh, elective, move to the cost side of the equation. So that's a very NLP uh, sentence. You have to be uh, on the cause and not on the effect. You know, like uh, uh, this job makes me sad. So I'm a victim of my job. Uh, my boss is not a, a good person. Is uh, uh, not good with me or uh, so basically putting you on the victim end instead of being in charge. You know, like I'm not a victim. I'm the captain of my destiny. I can change, I can, so helping your client move from the cost side, from the effect to the cost side, move from the victim to being the captain of their destiny. Huh? So a question you can ask them. Um, so for example, this job makes me sad. How exactly does your job makes you sad? Uh, how do you decide to feel sad? Huh? So putting them again, like I'm the one deciding to feel sad. Uh, when you are in your job, how do you decide to be sad? Now, that's another uh, way to ask. And so making the point that they are responsible for their internal state, they are in charge uh, and they are in control. Huh? Yeah. Uh, any, any question on that one? Yeah, okay, so very important. And when you hear your client uh, being like, a, if I may say, a victim, huh, that they play the victim, we all play it uh, once in a while, uh, challenge that uh, victim mindset. Huh? Okay. Uh, one question, yeah. uh, Lily, on this one. Yeah. When you get some clients that are really behaving as victims, mm -hmm. how do you transfer them into uh, people who will act? Because usually the victim stage is because they don't know or they are afraid of really going to the action. Yeah. So how do you really work on transforming them from the victim yeah. to really the action? Yeah, yeah. From being a, a owning a dad, so like my job makes me sad, like you, 
uh, I'm unhappy in that uh, in that job and like uh, yeah so yeah asking those questions that are here like uh, challenging them like uh, uh, showing them that they are again like showing them that they are responsible uh, for how they are feeling for their internal state and uh, and uh, uh, if you want to be a bit, a bit provocative, you can talk about uh, about uh, the cause and effect equation from the NLP and help them like uh, shift their mindset. But again, uh, in this uh, first stage of the ADCAR is very like transformational, so it takes time. And it's uh, I, I'm not saying like you're gonna ask two questions and then they're gonna switch from victim to like uh, being the master of their destiny, uh, basically. But, uh, do you have any example that you want to explore with us, maybe, maybe? like uh, someone? Uh, yeah, I got a client yeah. who really put himself as a victim. Yeah. And uh, when I really question this person, this person has difficulty to own the mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. And so I insist a lot on this part to make sure this person really uh, owns the problem. Yeah. And at the end, they make some step forward, and each time they can, they, they make some they come step back to the forward. Yeah. And that's my issue because I'm going to feel to be stuck in this area. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Anyone has any ideas for for Cedric here? How do you help someone get out of the victim mode? Maybe showing them what they are missing out, uh, almost like the limiting belief. Uh, a technique and what they are missing out from having that uh, mindset huh? like uh, if you're stuck with that mindset and you with that belief like it's a, i'm a victim it's not my fault uh, uh, that, that makes me unhappy or mark makes me angry or you know like uh, so yeah, yeah even explain yeah go go Jean. yeah now, I was just thinking i mean it's probably not very i don't know if it's helpful or not but just thinking about the impact that the behavior may have on other people as well mm. to help them realize that there may be consequences on that just mm -hmm. if you see what i mean that they yeah. have an impact on other people so yeah. maybe for them to realize that actually maybe they're not the victim or maybe they their victim behavior has some kind of negative effect around mm. them and maybe to help them to be aware of it and yeah. change that i don't know it's just yeah. an idea yeah like showing the ripple effect of the negative side and uh, yeah yeah definitely and that's an idea yeah perfect thank you Gilles. yeah maybe you can talk about the cause and effect equation on the nlp or being very straightforward with them or almost like you have two paths uh, and if you choose that path like the victim mode so visualizing what would it be if you choose like being a the captain of the destiny, what would you do? What, uh, how would you be in charge? And visualizing that also maybe, huh? yeah. But again, uh, not easy. Huh? It's like a transformational uh, topic, a mindset shift. Uh, um, they can also do journaling, you know, or, or also like a new sport, huh? like the, when the reframing technique. So each time they can sense that they are in, in the victim mode, like how can they shift out of that uh, if they are aware that they're doing it? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'm not sure you convinced uh, Cedric. Huh? Not, not easy. No, because uh, yeah. um, for me, I need to accept to spend some time on it. Yeah. And um, and for and I have one example in mind, and I think I need to spend several sessions on this. Uh, I maybe... cannot escape for me. That's my feeling, and from what I hear from you, uh, my feeling that I would need to spend the time. In. Yeah, yes. If you can offer, like, if if that's the one thing you can do for him, I think that would be massive. Huh? Helping someone, like, taking ownership of what they do, and uh, definitely. Mm. Huh? Uh, something else that you can do is like um, uh, role reversals. You can uh, act. Uh, do like a role, re role reversal with him, like where you play the victim, just to be like provocative and you put it at the extreme level. And I don't know in which situation, maybe it's with the, his wife or with his boss. And so you reverse the roles. Uh, another one is to look at role models. Do they know people that play victim, that are victims? And do they know people that are uh, 
in charge, a captain of their destiny. And so can they visualize those two people and, uh, and what do they prefer to be, you know, like, uh, uh, so that they're projecting themselves through uh, a mirror effect, a lens, another lens maybe. Uh, yeah, role reversal can be quite provocative, I think also, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'll try to think if I can think of anything else, um, but uh, yeah. Any other ideas, guys? Any, anyone has any idea for Cédric? Um, I was I was also thinking about, you know, when you, you say, well, you and Angihal didn't say sometimes, you know, you have to be bold and you have to yeah. to uh, maybe say, you know, I'm sen if, if you allow yeah. me to, to share this, you know, I'm sensing that, would that be a bit maybe too, too bold to say that yeah. I'm sensing that you're acting as a victim or is that a bit... Yeah, depending on the relationship you have. Yeah. yeah, depending on the relationship you have and like, uh, yeah, or the, yeah that this victim mindset is detriment to your to your goal or to your life or makes you unhappy depending on but she can be a bit provocative huh? yes huh? Uh, d d depending on the relationship you have and uh, how you feel the other person will react huh? Cedric is it something that would work like for you being a bit provocative and uh, sharing right. your observation yeah that's what I did uh, with one of the first clients <laughs> but my problem is that I got the feeling that I was too prescriptive Ah. At some point, to him, I hear that you need to take a I mean ownership on your actions. And so I have to tell them the, 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 the story, which I, I try to avoid to make them really realize that by themselves. Yeah. I think that if they discover it by themselves, it's more powerful. Yeah. And I'm not patient enough. So the first time I went to the solution. And, yeah. and how did they react? Well, I this idea. But, uh, I don't know, maybe I didn't do it in the proper way, so I would think about it. They didn't uh, react well when you said, they said that, I guess, or is it what you're saying? And then what they do, they just let you drive uh, after that. Huh? Ah, okay. If you start, I mean, driving, huh? they say, oh, yeah. you go first. Yeah. Since you know, yeah. that's the difficulty, and then you reverse the role. Yeah. When you start, the, the work is made by the coach, yeah. and at the end, it is done by the coach. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, hmm. yeah, this, uh, yeah. Are they aware that they are playing the victim, and if they are aware, how they can do that? So that's a different stages again of the awareness. Huh? Like, uh, yeah. Because I don't know about about all of you, but most of the the, the people that coach, they are looking for coaching, but they would appreciate even more mentoring. Yeah, ah. yeah. Maybe because you are more in. Uh, yeah. Yeah work mindset or being the HR of the people you, yeah. Ah, and that's a difficulty because each time I, start, I do one step with them and then it goes to the, to the mentoring. Yeah. Yeah, but it's more like a short-term impact. Yeah. When you do mentoring, they're not taking ownership and uh, no, not as deep, I guess, or and projecting your biases, huh, as we always said. Yeah. But I will try again. I will try again different way to see uh, if it works. Yeah. Because I need to, to test and see what works. And so thank you for your ideas. And again, what you said, you're welcome. And again, what you said is like when you are, you went to more prescriptive, more mentoring, they, they, withdrew, they withdrew, huh? You were saying like, uh, they, so that may not be the right uh, way to do it uh, instead of uh, helping them find yeah, their own I work on my process of doing it. Yeah, it's not That's easy, it's a big uh, shift. Huh? Perfect, okay. So think of someone that you regularly work with or interact with and that you're struggling with, you know, like a, a relationship that has been very difficult with you, like for you, like challenging. Uh, and you feel that person has been, uh, is uh, very challenging to interact with, huh? okay? So first, I think the person is a problem. So you think like of that person and really this person is the problem, that's why, uh, uh, we're having difficulty. It's uh, all uh, because of uh, that person that we have uh, this issue. Second mindset shift. I think this person has a problem. So this person has a problem like uh, that they need to solve. Uh, and that's why we have a, a difficult relationship. That's why we have this issue. And the third mindset shift. Okay, uh, I think this person is on a learning journey and is very capable, resourceful and full of potential. Uh, and so we're going to work uh, together uh, to help that person grow. Huh? So 
again, that's a, a mindset shift in terms of uh, uh, a problem, like uh, where is the problem? And when you're coaching someone, is it the person is a problem, as a problem, or they're really cap capable? And as a coach, like uh, always putting in that uh, third uh, mindset shift, huh, basically. Huh? Yes. Any comments, any questions? Okay. Uh, so if we are not in the right mindset to change, huh, so that uh, that can happen. Uh, the ladder of inference. Anyone knows about the ladder of inference? So uh, basically, it's about like how much we have different filters before between the uh, reality, the real facts at the bottom of the ladder, and our actions, uh, because we have the reality, the facts. So that's, uh, we have our own map of the world, our own vision of the world. I always say like we are all experiences, experiencing uh, this elective, this webinar today, but we all have our unique experience. We all have our selected reality. And then we interpret that reality based on our belief. Then we have assumptions, then conclusions, then our own belief, and then we take actions. Huh? So we have so many filters between what is the reality and the action that we're gonna have. So I, I, I love this one. So, uh, so if we look at the first line, looking at the fact, so Judy is presenting ideas to a small group of her colleagues. George is looking at his phone uh, during the presentation. Uh, George's attention is on his phone. So that's the meaning of the selected data. Uh, and then my assumption, okay, uh, George is not paying attention to me. Uh, he thinks that uh, it's not important what I'm saying. And so that's uh, Judy decides, okay, I'm going to ignore, ignore George because he's not a, he doesn't think I'm important. What I'm saying is important. So based on a, uh, on a fact, on a selected fact, then uh, I'm, assuming, uh, I'm assuming things. And then the action is, uh, uh, okay, now I'm going to ignore George. Second line, the second person is Bill. Uh, so Bill is like uh, putting his hand in his pocket uh, and closing his eyes uh, and he has like an antagonistic uh, stance. So that's the meaning of, of the data. And my assumption, okay, uh, uh, Bill, uh, it's a waste of time. Like uh, uh, Bill doesn't want to listen to me. Uh, he, thinks my, no, he thinks my presentation is a waste of time. And so uh, later, Judy aggressively de defend her ideas to Bill. Uh, she, she's in an aggressive stance because she could sense some aggressivity from, from Bill. And again, that could be another reason. Uh, there are some cultures where they close their eyes to listen uh, deeper to what she's saying, you know, so could be many different uh, interpretations. Huh? And the last one, uh, uh, Judy is scratching her head, like she looks confused. Uh, so uh, I'm assuming, okay, she's scratching her head, she looks confused, then uh, uh, she's not very smart. Uh, and so what, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to send her like a patronizing email explaining my presentation. Uh, let me dumb things down for you to understand a bit better. Huh? So again, we do that quite often, where we look at facts, we interpret those facts, the meanings we assume things uh, and there's a disconnect between the reality and the action that we're going to take huh? so that's the inference uh, ladder uh, any any question on that have you experienced that uh, lately have you experienced it yeah okay so it's we, every day huh? we can every see day. that every day yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Every meeting, we can see uh, behavior that are what they, they should not be. For example, somebody has something in his mind or in her mind because something happened before the meeting. And everything is really interpreted inside the meeting. So yeah. there are a lot of I mean, misunderstanding starting from uh, those kind of details. Yeah. But at the end, it can create many, many conflicts. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it's about like going back to the facts, understanding the facts and not making the wrong assumptions. Huh? Mm -hmm. So as you say, it happens every day. 
yesterday with my husband it was like uh, asking him about his day and he said like oh it's stre stressing me out that you're always asking me every day and i'm saying that's a wrong interpretation i'm not asking to 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 be back to you i'm asking because i care you know so those like misalignment between like uh, uh, intention facts and what uh, they're how they are interpret interpreted so that's as uh, Cedric was mentioning, they are happening every day. So helping your client move down the ladder. So going back to the reality and facts. And so understanding where your client is in that, in that ladder. So uh, is there a miss at which stage there is a misalignment uh, between the action that was taken and the reality? Is there, is there a wrong assumption, wrong interpretation of reality? Uh, wrong uh, conclusion and so based on where they are on the ladder you can ask different questions that are on this uh, on this slide i will give you this slide also at the end of the session i won't go through all of them all the questions but basically helping your client understanding that uh, they are interpreting the reality compared to going back to the reality and facts yeah. any question on that Okay, so metaphors, so that's another technique. As I say, we're going like a recipe book uh, showing you different techniques uh, about that. So again, metaphor, they can be very sticky. I don't know if you have tried to coach a client through a metaphor. Uh, someone is, Cedric, I think you're smiling. Is it because of that or? Yeah, because the metaphor is very personal. Uh -huh. And especially when you have, uh, you are working there. Like different i mean culture a culture environment there is um, many mistakes made by those metaphors and uh, for some people are using that to explain what they have in mind mm -hmm. and from another culture it doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. yeah um, it's funny because always the people they <laughs> they do not understand each other yes and have you coached uh, with the metaphor has anyone coached with the metaphor using a metaphor like yeah yeah, when I know the culture, yes, yes. When I'm sure that what I'm saying is correct, yes. Can you give us an example how you did it? Uh, just, I mean, when I talk, uh, yeah. I don't have any precise example, but when I talk to people, mm -hmm. I use a lot of metaphors that mm -hmm. would help them to understand. But I, yeah. when I do that, I need to know them quite well. Yeah. And to understand how they, how culturally they are and yeah. make sure that what I tell them is okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So in France, uh, we use a lot of metaphors in France when we speak. Yeah. Yes. So like what French people is that what I think. Yeah, definitely. So it's uh, easier like when the metaphor comes from them, but you can also play with the metaphor that comes from you. Uh, an example like uh, uh, I could say, OK, uh, which is a reality like uh, when I the, when the first time that I was a manager, I was very much like a bulldozer and uh, it was difficult for me to switch from uh, internal uh, individual contributor compared to like uh, being a manager and most important was the goal and being a bulldozer and so bulldozer is such a strong word and then the coaching could be okay tell me more uh, what, what it is uh, to be a bulldozer what do you mean uh, uh, who are the people around you uh, on the bulldozer what are you doing uh, what could be a new car or a new uh, way of uh, 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 going, uh, yeah, new transportation. Uh, okay, that could be a nice uh, family car, uh, uh, I don't know, Mercedes, a family car. Okay, and so who would be in that car with you? Where would you, uh, how different would it be from a bulldozer? You know, so playing, uh, playing with the metaphor, basically. Huh? Especially when the metaphor comes from them, it's, you can play. Huh? So uh, some that are here, like, uh, uh, I feel right now I'm in a fog, uh, my situation, I don't know what to do. I feel very much in the fog. And so again, you can play with that. Uh, uh, I want to be the captain of my destiny. Okay, so uh, what would be your destination? What kind of boat Who would be on the boat with you? What would you do? So uh, playing with that. Uh, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, again, huh? so what would be at the end of the tunnel? How would it be? What is in this tunnel with you right now, uh, etc. 
So again, that's very, very powerful. And so when you do peer coaching practice sessions, uh, try to play with metaphors uh, uh, to be more comfortable with that. But that's super, super sticky for your client if you do that. Yeah. Any questions so far? Yeah, Lucy, RB, Sravana, Jeffrey, Echo, yeah. Okay, so journaling, and we talked about journaling. Huh? So when it's very deep and people are struggling and uh, they are struggling expressing uh, their, uh, where they are stuck, uh, journaling can be good. Uh, when you have people like uh, introverts, for example, can be good also for introverts huh? and then you can debrief uh, what they are journaling. Huh? Okay. So we've, uh, we've been through the awareness stage. So investigate disease, facing fears, limiting belief, de-victimization, inference ladder, metaphors, journaling. We've talked also about uh, role reversal, role models, uh, 360, and the wheel of life, and sharing observation. Anything else that you can think of? Okay. So. Basically, again, huh? so when a client is stuck, understanding at which level they are stuck. Huh? Are they aware that they need to change? If not, you, you stay on that stage. If they know that they need to change, okay, do they want to change? Do they want, do they desire to change? Do they desire to participate in the change? Okay, so let's move to the D. Uh, usually, uh, be careful when you do the grow model, spend time, a lot of time on the G and the R. Sometimes it happens to me that I would spend like uh, three sessions. So there, there was one that said, okay, I want to work on my executive presence. Okay, what does it mean an executive presence? Like uh, spend a lot of time on the G and validate the G. Huh? So you, again, when we talked about the wheel of life earlier, some people can come to you for a goal, but it can be a different goal. Uh, so investigate this goal through, through the why. So how do you investigate through the why? So we've, uh, we've done that in, in the past with, with many of you. Uh, so I want to lose weight. Okay, so can you tell me more? Uh, what is driving you uh, to lose the weight? Why is it important? Okay, I just uh, delivered a baby. I feel, I feel chubby. I cannot stay with that weight. Okay, so can you tell me more? Why is it important for you not to be chubby? Uh, okay, I want to look good uh, for my family, for my kid. I want to, uh, so why is it important for you to look good? Okay, I want to be more athletic, to be able to work with my, to, to play with my kid, uh, to run around, to, to, show, to show her some new sports. Okay, and so going deeper into unpeeling the different layer of the onions and going deeper on the why. Huh? So you can really understand uh, uh, the why and then what will help you, uh, what will this goal help you feel? How would you feel when you reach your goal? Uh, and then you can use scaling technique. Huh? Uh, how motivated are you uh, to reach your goal from a scale from one to 10? And then the power uh, technique, P-A-W, how possible it is for you to reach your goal from a scale from one to 10, the P of the, of the power, the A, the ability, how able are you to reach your goal? How worthy uh, are you of uh, reaching your goal from a scale from one to 10? Pow, P A W, possibility, ability, worthy. Huh? So the three Y, the, uh, the, the POW, and then the visualization. Okay, visualizing your goal, uh, either visualization or the visualization board or the journaling huh, to visualize the goal. Huh? Okay. So sorry, maybe I may be going fast, but uh, it's a recap of uh, many of the electives that we've done. Huh? Any, any questions on that so far? So visualizing huh, uh, what failure looks like. So we've talked about that. Uh, where would you be if you stay with that, uh, with that belief, if you stay in that, uh, uh, if you're stuck in that, uh, in that situation? Uh, what will happen in one year, in five years, and in 10 years? Uh, what would be the impact on your time, on your energy, on your self-esteem, on your family, friends, on your health, on your finances? Uh, 
what would you tell yourself in the mirror in 10 years? Huh? So we've mentioned that. Um, visualize what success looks like. Huh? It's not only the negative. So the negative, uh, it gives a sense of urgency. The positive, uh, it's also a strong uh, driver. Again, not only like visualizing, like uh, uh, closing the eyes, but that could be uh, uh, having a vision board uh, or journaling uh, the vision. Huh? Okay. So if you don't know where you're going, it's going to be tougher to know uh, how to do it, huh, basically. Yeah. The growth and the fixed mindset, I'm sure a lot of you know that. Uh, so having a fix, fixed mindset, uh, everything is uh, limited. Everything is already uh, set in stone. Uh, I don't want to be challenged. My potential is predetermined. My life is, a, uh, there's a faith. Uh, my life is predetermined. That's a fixed mindset. And helping your client go from fixed mindset to growth mindset. Uh, I love challenges. Uh, feedbacks are constructive. Uh, I like trying new things. I'm inspired by others. I can learn. I want to fail and learning. Failure is an opportunity to grow. Huh? Uh, compared to failure is the limit of my abilities. Any question on that? Feedbacks? So sharing your observation, uh, we've mentioned that. Huh? Uh, that can be a bit tricky. So we've mentioned that like uh, uh, with Cedric, like uh, his client uh, being a victim, going into victim mode. Uh, may I share, can I share something with you? May I share uh, my intuition with you? So again, uh, you, you may break the relationship, uh, taking a risk of sharing an observation. So ask uh, uh, for permission. Uh, my intuition tells me I have a sense. I wonder if, may I share something with you? Are you willing to be coach on this topic? Yeah. Uh, paradoxical intervention, I love that one. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, someone struggling to sleep, being insomniac. Uh, um, so if I take a step back, sorry. Uh, paradoxical intervention is really like, uh, again, being uh, provocative and you could say, okay, I can sense that you don't really want to change. You know, like again, we talked about being a bold coach, being provocative, and to see what is the reaction. So it's a bit like in martial art, you don't play uh, against your opponent, you play your opponent's force uh, and same. So if you are asking an insomniac to stay awake compared to asking them uh, to try to get some sleep, so, in that situation, you ask them to stay awake instead of asking them to go to sleep. Again, like uh, being provocative. Huh? So I can sense that you don't really want to change. I can sense that you prefer to stay in this victim mode. Huh? That's, uh, so that's again being bold and provocative, but that could work sometime like uh, shaking them a bit. Huh? Any question on that? Okay. The switch technique, and we've uh, talked about that, uh, the switch technique, uh, I won't go through that. Uh, the change curve. So again, I'm going into this uh, recipe book of different techniques. Uh, Cedric mentioned that, the change curve, very important. So um, when your client goes into uh, a trauma or something very difficult or, or so, uh, uh, that could be at work or in the personal life, or they could have been uh, fired, uh, uh, they, they're going through a divorce. Uh, most of the people, if not all, go through those stages of uh, the change curve. First, it's a shock. They are, they are shocked by what's happening. Uh, I don't know, someone just passed away. They, they are very shocked by what's happening. Then they are in denial, disbelief. That's not uh, really happening. I don't, uh, in strong denial. Then the frustration and the anger. Uh, I'm sure you, you know a lot of people that, that are going through that and they are in this anger stage. And that's very normal. You have to respect the process of them being angry. I don't know, someone going through a divorce and they may go through that. They may certainly go through that angry stage that taking a, a bit of time or not, but they have to go through that. Huh? Uh, it's very important for you to know at which stage your client is because you're not gonna coach them the same way if they are in shock, denial, frustration compared to if they are in this upward uh, slope. Uh, 
it's going to be very difficult uh, uh, to, to, to coach them if they're in an angry stage. Huh? So in that stage, for example, they have to vent. So let them vent, let them have this avenue of uh, venting. And it's not at all the right time to go into like a, a, a deep uh, transformation. Huh? So it's more in the depression stage, uh, experiment, decision, and integration. Any question on that? Okay. So that's in the desire stage. So uh, focus on the why. Uh, someone was saying that, yes, the why, the what, and the how, that was uh, Cédric. The anchoring, the visualization, so negative and positive, the paradoxical intervention, the switch, and the change curve. Then the knowledge. So now it's going to be easier. Huh? Like uh, those two first stages are the toughest one. How to change. So I'm going to so, uh, focus on the strengths, uh, the strengths uh, technique, huh? the, um, the strengths tool. Uh, so helping them, what are my strengths? Uh, what can I leverage on? Look at past successes. So the life map is a good one. Uh, uh, giving them... Uh, uh, that they feel uh, empowered, like I've done that in the past, I can do that again. So helping them find their own strengths. The magazine interview. Uh, so that's a very good uh, technique. Uh, if I had time, I would do it with you. So basically, you do your own magazine interview. Huh? So for example, uh, uh, what is unique about yourself? Uh, what uh, has set you apart from other people in your life? Um, what are the reasons why you took the path that you took? What are the obstacles that you have overcome? Uh, what are your key personal characteristics that have been very valuable to you? Uh, and what would be this uh, background quote? Uh, and what would the people say when they give a quote about you? Huh? So do that exercise for yourself, actually. Uh, actually, I think we should add that as a tool. I'm just writing it down in the... Uh, in the toolbox, yeah. uh, that could be quite valuable. Yeah, could Go be on. a good tool huh? because yeah. I, I use that uh, uh -huh. with uh, two clients, uh -huh. and uh, it was good. Okay, so I'm gonna add it. Uh, I'm gonna add it uh, yeah. this week. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's gonna be it's on the too, toolbox. Uh, yeah. The what is very important that is that they do it carefully, mm -hmm. and that's the difficulty because if they do it in five minutes, mm -hmm. not very very useful. But one. I did it carefully and uh, was very happy. And he felt, he felt very proud after the oh. completing this task. Because when you look at the question, it really makes you think about what is unique in yourself uh -huh. and, and globally where are the areas in which you are the best. Oh, amazing. Thank uh, you for sharing. Good, huh? Yeah. Any other yeah, questions uh, we should I did add? That yeah. with one guy who was very happy. Huh? OK, perfect. Uh, Reni, you're asking, you're raising your hand. I can see. Do you want to ask a question? Go for it. Huh? Yeah, I just want to check uh, the last question for this magazine interview. Who would you ask for a background quote and what would they say? Mm -hmm. What do you uh, So it's your own, uh, for example, Reni, I'm coaching you. Uh, and so uh, who would you ask for a, back, for a quote about you? Like uh, which uh, friend or family or colleague would you ask for a quote about you? I'm, I'm a journalist. And I'm writing a magazine interview about you. Uh, who would you ask around you, like for a quote, and what would be that quote? So the quote. So let's say uh, I have a friend. Yeah. Then the friend will quote something about me. Yeah, but you have to imagine yourself, and you're doing it everything with yourself in your head. Uh, you know, like you're you're writing it down. You're doing your own magazine interview. Huh? So, so what is would is it similar to like what would let's say what would my friend would say about me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. Exactly. So it could okay. be friend, could be family, could be colleagues. Huh? Yeah. Okay, got yeah. it. Yeah, but you're right. What would they say about you? I would I would make it uh, easier to understand. Uh, yes. Perfect. Um, I, I have a, a quick question about this yeah. one as well. Um, so Cédric was saying that you know, don't do it in five minutes, give the, mm -hmm. the, the, the coach the time to think about it. Is it something that you would rather give them as, you know, between sessions or mm -hmm. sit down with them to do it with them? Yeah, I would what, do it what? between sessions. I would do it between sessions so they have time, you know, like, uh, mm. because if you, usually I do like 90 minutes, one hour to 90 minute session, if you spend half an hour on that. Uh, so it's easier that they have their own time. Uh, 
and uh, Jeffrey was talking about uh, 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 in, uh, introverts uh, and introvert they need even more time to write things down so if you are looking at them watching them while they're doing it uh, give them time and they they may even take a few days coming back on it or you know so yeah uh, are you agreeing with that uh, when you did it, uh, Cédric? Yeah, two times in between sessions. Yeah, yeah. perfect. And, and so it helped them, like when you did it, uh, Cédric, it helped them uh, feel more confident, basically. Huh? The first one, yes. The second one, he did it uh, high level. I, I think he spent five minutes on it. Ah, okay. But the first one, he spent, I mean, some time. I cannot give you the number of minutes, but I think a lot. Mm -hmm. And he was very happy with it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you should tell them beforehand, like you're going to get as much as you give, you know, it's like in this webinar, you can be fully present and uh, uh, looking at it, watching it, like being actively present or not. Uh, and so you're going to get as much as you receive and same with all the tools that you're doing. Yeah? Yes. So make sure you tell them that also before doing the tools. Huh? Yeah. Any, any other comments, feedbacks on that one? Okay, uh, so the past uh, now in the future, uh, focus on what worked in the past at the life map, uh, focus on what success looked like with visualization. Uh, so uh, you can use both, we've, uh, we've mentioned that. Uh, and the mindset shift now, uh, we've talked about victim mindset, uh, uh, limiting belief. Uh, hmm. There's an equation for some people who are more like uh, in this kind of uh, mindset, uh, DVFR to test the four conditions for change. So basically the D, the V, the F have to be stronger than the R. The D is the dissatisfactions uh, that I'm really dissatisfied by the situation. I really want to change uh, because I'm dissatisfied. The vision, huh? so you have to have like a strong vision. Uh, so the steps, the first steps, so do you have steps? Is it clear where how, how I'm gonna achieve my goal? And the resistance. So we've mentioned all those resistance could be like a limiting belief, uh, uh, for example. So we've mentioned that. That could be also a, a framework that you use as a coach. There's the ADCAR framework, or that could be the DVFR, uh, where, where they are in those four dimensions. Okay. So uh, we've talked about uh, the knowledge part, how to change the strengths, the past successes, the magazine interviews. Really, those are about like building the self-confidence that they have the knowledge, that they trust that they have the knowledge to, to know how to change. Huh? And the DVF, DVFR equation, ability to change. Um, so we've talked about the power process. How able do you feel you are to change uh, from a scale from one to 10? That's a way to test uh, uh, this A of the ad car the possibility, the ability, the worthiness, uh, and again, from a scale from one to 10. So for me, I love to use that to validate the goal. So validating the goal, you have the three Ys, you have that, and you have the uh, visualization. Okay. Uh, so again, you can explore assumptions. What makes you think that? I'm too shy to talk in public. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not able. Uh, uh, to talk in public. Uh, okay, what makes you think that? Uh, are you really incapable of uh, talking in public? You can't talk in public, so challenging mirroring. Uh, that works quite well sometimes. Huh? So when you have someone that has like a limiting belief like that, uh, I, I can't do that, I'm not able. Uh, even like I'm not able to find time uh, to write my resume, to redo my resume. Are you really incapable of finding time to write your resume? So when it's you mirroring, then it makes them uh, react sometimes. Uh, explore emotion. What does it mean uh, being shy? Uh, what emotion are you experiencing? And asking permission to share hard truths. Huh? So we've talked about that. Uh, may I share with you? May I share what I'm noticing? Are you willing to be coached on this issue? Shift perspective. So we talked about that, the role reversal. Huh? Uh, uh, with Cedric, for example, on the someone being a victim or you feel that they are stuck. Uh, uh, you can play the role uh, uh, reversal, practicing a new behavior, so a victim mode or, or another behavior, um, finding areas that need to be strength, strengthened, 
uh, and the coachee can see through other person's eyes and can reduce conflict. So that's uh, the role reversal. Uh, you can also practice that uh, with uh, uh, in the practice sessions, uh, like when you do peer coaching, uh, so that you feel more confident with the role reversal and shifting uh, perspective. Has anyone tried role, re role reversal before? Yep. Yeah. And it yeah. works. Huh? It, uh, it works quite well. I use Tell that um, for a person who is not confident about uh, his business card. Mm. And uh, so I use different type of jobs. And I told him, OK, you have one minute. Do as if you were a salesperson. Do as if you were an engineer, financial, and a CEO. And then I told him how yourself uh, you behave uh, in front of people. Are uh, you behaving like this, this, this? And it was very helpful. Yeah. And so you acted as if you were him? Huh? I, I, I told him to act himself. Okay, you acted, okay. He acted himself, I told him perfect. Act as if you would do that. Yes. As if you would do that, and I was changing. Are you sure perfect. this? Are you sure this? Okay. So that I obliged him to force the... Okay, the perfect. So that's role playing. And role reversal is a bit, uh, a bit different. It's like when you're really playing the other person. Huh? So, for example, a coach would come to you at this uh, difficult uh, discussion to have with my boss. Uh, okay, so you, you could do a, a role playing like you did. So you play the boss and he plays himself. And then you can sh uh, shift. Okay, now we're going to do the opposite. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm yourself and you're the boss. So they can uh, exteriorize all their fears, you know, like uh, uh, I'm scared my boss is going to be an angry person. He's going to be angry at me. Okay, so now play the anger pers angry person and I play you. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, morph compulsion into inconvenience. So that's a very specific to some cases. Uh, for example, if you have a smoker or someone that eats uh, too much, uh, for example, I want to lose weight right, right now. Uh, I'm not going to buy chips because I know if I buy chips, uh, I'm going to eat all packet now or I want to make it super difficult, put it in a very difficult place for me to reach, or you put your pack of cigarettes like uh, at a very distant uh, place. So it's tougher for you to reach uh, that. So morphing uh, compulsion into uh, inconvenience, that's from uh, Milton Erickson. Huh? So that's the uh, A. Uh, so, yeah. One question here, does it work on a sustainable way or not? Uh, what do you mean? Yeah. Uh, because for example, the smoker, the fact that it's difficult for them. Yeah. Uh, if I take this example, because it worked at some point. Yeah. Because I think it worked when it was very difficult. And as soon mm. as the people were able to remove this constraint, then they came back to the old habits. Mm. Yeah, the good yeah. question, a very good question. So is it something you have to do uh, for your lifetime, basically? Or, or is it something that you could get into a new habit? Huh? Yeah, I think there's no uh, one size fits all here. Yeah. Yeah, difficult for, yes, uh, look, I, I'm, I'm hoping that if you get uh, convinced that this new habit is positive, you could, but it's uh, addictions uh, take time to, to overcome, I would say. Yeah. Anyone have any feedback, any comments on that? Or? Yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna move a bit faster. The last stage is reinforcement. Uh, uh, so having an accountability a support system, huh? we talked about addiction, how do you reinforce uh, uh, this new habit, like I'm not smoking anymore. So having a support system, uh, accountability, huh? uh, accountability partner. So as a coach, always ask, okay, who is your accountability partner? Who could be your accountability partner? What is your support system? Uh, very, very important uh, to do that almost at each session at the end of the session. Huh? Uh, three principles to drive behavior. So there are uh, social incentives. So I love it's, uh, uh, so yes, there are social incentives. So hearing the opinions of others, there are immediate rewards. So quick wins uh, and rewards. Uh, how do you reward yourself? And nurturing the pro progress, uh, uh, being in this uh, virtual uh, virtual uh, circle. Huh? Uh, and so basically, uh, when you look now at uh, electricity bills, they are very good, at least in Singapore, and I think in France I've seen that also. Uh, 
they compare you with your neighbors. So that's a social incentive or you are uh, uh, consuming that much energy compared to your neighbors uh, and the rewards and the nurturing the progress. Also, they are looking at how you are been progressing compared to the past few months. And so uh, when you look at electricity bills now in some countries, they go through those uh, three principles uh, that are driving behavior, social incentive, immediate reward, and nurturing the progress. So as a coach, being aware of those uh, in this uh, last stage of uh, reinforcement. Uh, again, uh, what is your support system? What are the social incentives that they may have? Uh, the immediate report, Im immediate rewards, uh, and uh, what are the baby steps that they can do? and how to uh, be in this uh, virtual uh, circle. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a recap. Uh, okay, can you tell me what has been the biggest learning each of you? Like, could you voice it out? I like the inconvenience. Ah, yes. I use that a lot for myself, actually. Yes. So you're gonna do that with your coaches, with yourself? Well, I did it before, but I didn't know there is a specific term for that. Oh, how have you done it before? Uh... My client was, uh, she liked to binge eating. Ah. She liked a lot of snacks, chocolate especially. Yes. So, I told her, uh, so I told her that, okay, uh, so one of the strategies that we came out together was to say, okay, uh, then uh, she will stock up less and then she's supposed to buy only when she needed it. So she's not supposed to have a cabinet full of her snacks. Perfect, perfect, yeah. perfect. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Thank you, Rennie. Anyone, so anyone else? Yeah, for me, it was the AdCar model because yeah. I used a part of each of the steps, but I was not able to put everything uh -huh. inside this model. And I think that's very powerful if we are capable to use this to analyze uh, the situation each time we have this kind of difficulty with the recent change. So perfect. very useful, thank you. Thank you. So again, understanding at which stage they are in terms of ad car model and in terms of technique, those are techniques that I brainstorm with Geraldine, but we are not like, uh, we don't know everything in the world now. Huh? So you can also create your own uh, model, like for each of the step, uh, which one do you prefer? Which one do you like huh? creating your own methodology? Huh? Go Master Coach.